I have the pleasure, I am blessed to open this book of Luke with you. And I am so thankful to do it because it's such a good book. It's one of the few books in the Bible I really like. I'm just kidding. I like them all, but they're good. <laughs> It's a unique book. I think that's why I like it. It's going to take us till the end of the year, I think, but it has 59% of the scripture is unique to Luke. And the reason is you're talking about a Gentile doctor. Gentile just means non-Jew. So you have a Gentile doctor. Before this point, before this point in history, the God that is spoken of is the Jewish God. It's always been the Jewish God. And the Gentiles, those that were non-Jews, kind of just saw the Jewish God. Well, now we have this guy, Luke, traveling with Paul as an eyewitness to all these cool moments, and he's writing it down to the Gentiles saying, this God is yours. This is for everyone. And he's writing these parables where the other guys, so you have four different perspectives on Jesus with the Gospels. The other guys are writing to other audiences, speaking of kind of some pretty major moments. And Luke's like, this parable over here that's nowhere else in the Bible, you've got to see this one because it's especially for those that don't have that background, that history. It's so unique. Some parts of it, he even says, you're not going to understand this. And it's the simplest of parables. I'm always like, how would they not understand that? He's just spreading some seed. That's one of them. He goes, you're not going to get this, but we're spreading seed. It's so funny. I'm like, this is amazing. So I, I'm kind of pumped for it. I, I kind of like, I like the book. And Johnny did an incredible job last week of setting us up. This is for everyone. This is for the hurting. This is for the outcast. This is for all the people who thought this God wasn't, they weren't good enough for this God. It was always that God over there. And so this is kind of a very unique look at all of these stories saying, no, this is for you right now with what you're facing right here. And it starts with Mary and the Magnificat. The Magnificat is actually a pretty famous part of religion. It's called Mary's Song. It comes from the very first verses that she says her song back to the angel Gabriel, but really to God, when the angel Gabriel says, you're now going to have the child of God himself within you. And then she says back the Magnificat. And you really see this a lot with um, cathedrals do it a lot. Uh, uh, monasteries, they whisper the Magnificat all the time. You see see it in uh, usually like rural churches that will use this as the Christmas message. So you see it in a lot of places, but this is the original gospel. This is about 30 weeks before Bethlehem and the nativity scene. This is the original gospel of her saying what's about to happen and everything that's about to happen. It's 30 years before Calvary and Easter. So this is where you see it all begin. So what does she say? Verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Before we get into the details of all that, let's talk about Mary. So Mary has a, a very interesting uh, spectrum. On There's some churches out there that treat Mary like God herself, like she's put on the highest pedestal possible. And then there's some churches on the other side that barely mention her. She's hardly ever even in the story. She's just the, the woman in the nativity scene. And so those are two extremes and both are, are wrong. There's, there's a middle ground here. Uh, Mary, the first words we hear about Mary is Verse 26, greetings you who are highly favored. Why was Mary chosen? Greetings, you are highly favored. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. He found favor in you. And so now you are going to be this special tool of God. Now why would he do that? Verse 38 tells you everything you need to know. In fact, it's really the only thing that you need to walk out of here with. You could just ignore the rest of the sermon. You could just read verse 38 and you're set. You're actually set for life. You don't have to come back to church if you will do verse 38. Now, we're bad at that, so you have to come every week. But here's what it says. I am the Lord's servant. 
May your word to me be fulfilled. If we'll all do that, then we're done. That's it. That's all you have to do. And that's why Mary's chosen. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. You're about to give me this blessing of the child of God in me. Your word be done. Remember Pastor Johnny's theme that we talked about last week. Uh, we are setting this up as Jesus is for everyone. Including this young woman. She's probably 13 years old. Let that sink in. 13, maybe 14 at the most. And God comes to her through an angel and says, I'm choosing you. It's in Nazareth. Nazareth, by its own like admission, several times in the Bible, there's nothing that comes out of Nazareth. It's this nowhere town. There's nothing that happens there. So where does God go? The nowhere town and talks to a 13-year-old girl and says, you have been chosen. Your humbleness is what I have noticed in you. And she says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. That's where it really comes from, the Magnificat. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You're choosing me? Okay, I'm in. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. It's fascinating. Why does he show up there? Why does he show up in her? And the answer, number one, is humbleness. She shows humbleness. We many times are lacking humbleness and it's probably because the world has a view of humbleness that is not the not the view of the Bible. They do not understand what humbleness means according to the Bible. In fact, they have this idea of what a Christian should look like because they tell us all the time, this is what a Christian should be doing. You know, they tell us what humbleness is and it's not the same humbleness that we read in the Bible. See, Mary knew her word. All of the Magnificat is coming from Old Testament scriptures. She's picking different pieces and pulling it into her praise to God. It's what we should all do in our prayer or our worship of God. You're pulling from the word and going, I just speak this to you. I speak it back to you. So what she's speaking back to him actually comes from Psalms 34 where it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Remember what she said? My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, when you take Psalm 34 and you start to look at it for what is humbleness? Why did she pick Psalm 34? Why is she picked in her humbleness? Let's look at it. So turn your Bibles to Psalm 34. What you will find is a very different view of humbleness. Verse 4 says, He delivered me from all my fears. Verse 5 says, Never covered with shame. I'm never covered with shame. You see, the, the, the humbleness that's sometimes put on us is this shame that we should feel. But that's not how it works. When you know God is God and he is in you, you actually start to get stronger and stronger in our world. But the humbleness it moves to God. I humble myself before God. That makes me stronger in the world. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. It begins with fear. And he delivers them. Verse 8, blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Can we humble ourselves and say, God is God and I am not. And I put my refuge in him. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What's he moving to? Your humbleness means you start to obey what it means to be righteous. Your lips are pure. Your words do not lie because you know who God is. So your humbleness shows up in the world, but it shows up because you want to honor God. Verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Verse 22, the Lord rescues his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Why does he choose Mary? Because Mary understands what humility is. 
Because when she puts herself in refuge of God, God notices. And when he, he comes to her and says, you are now blessed, she says, go back to verse 38. It's the only thing you really have to learn today. Verse 38, what does it say? I'm your servant. I'm your servant. Is that how we respond? I am your servant. Your words be true in me. That word servant, in the Greek, it's doula. It actually means slave. Okay, do we still want to say this? God, I'm your slave. Whatever you tell me to do, I do. Period. I'm willing to follow you wherever you say to go. Just tell me where to go. Now this is the first, the first time we see this phrase in the New Testament. Lord, I am your servant. I will do whatever you want. Now we see later all the disciples put it into their gospels right at the beginning. Paul does it over and over and over. I am your bond slave. I am your bond slave. I'm your bond servant, Lord. Whatever you want to do in me, I'm in. In fact, bond slave takes it a whole other level. I go up to the post. This is getting into way too far, but you have to like literally put your earlobe and you hit into the post and you say, I do whatever you want out of choice. I choose to follow whatever you say. That's what Paul does. Where does he get it? Mary. He learns and the rest of the disciples learn this gospel message forward from a woman probably about 13 or 14 years old. The first speaker they're learning for. A woman speaker that they are men learning from. There's another sermon there that I'm not going to share today. But it's there. Go back to Luke 1 verse 48. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Can we get here? Can we learn from this? From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Why is she called blessed? Humbleness. There's a creator. There's a God. And he is God, and I am not. She understood this. This God loves me. This God protects me. This God cares for me. He actually cares about the words coming out of my mouth. He wants me to be pure. He wants me to be righteous. And because he is God and I am not, I will do it. He told me to do it, so I will do it. Humbleness is why God can use her. Where are we? Let's go on. Verse 49. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. The second takeaway. Remember, this is why does God show up? Where does God show up in this world? The second one is those who praise him. He shows up to those who praise him. She is experiencing angel Gabriel showing up and telling her about this blessing that's beyond her imagination. And how does she respond? Praise. Let's look closer at the structure. So the angel Gabriel says this in verse 26. Greetings you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. How does she respond? Verse 47. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Her response is praise. The angel Gabriel says in verse 30, don't be afraid Mary, you found favor with God. Her response is 48, from now on all generations will call me blessed. You are favored, all generations are going to call me blessed. The angel Gabriel says in verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. What does she say to that? Verse 49, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His name is Jesus. Holy is his name. Angel Gabriel says in verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. What does she say? Verse 50, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation to generation to generation. It's going to get to us. And the same thing that he's describing that's going to happen 
For those who fear him, for those who humble themselves, for those who praise him, he continues to do the same thing today. The angel Gabriel says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Interesting phrase. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What's her response to this? Verse 51, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. See, Mary's direct response is to praise. And there's this, there's this thought that she knows could be there. The Son of God is in me. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. But no, she says, scatter those thoughts Anything that's gonna, anything that's gonna be proud, I want those inmost thoughts gone because, like you said, this is gonna overshadow me. It's what we all have to do. We all have to go, okay, I have God, I'm pretty excited, there's a moment to get pumped up, but I want him to overshadow me. And when my pride gets in there, we talk about pride so much. When pride gets in there, Scatter those thoughts. I want Christ to be magnified in me. I am a reflection of God. I want him to be seen over me. That's why she's chosen. Over and over. We just sing about it. Make room. Make room because when Jesus shows up, honestly, just get out the way. There's nothing else you can do. Just make room and say, I praise you. Why do we even sing songs? It's a really weird thing that we do every week. Where else do you show up and they're like, all right, time for songs together, guys. Where else do you do that? It's because we really don't know what else to do here. Think about it. You can get the word on your own. You can go have wonderful messages. But when we talk about church and God and humbling ourselves at some point you go, I don't even know what to do next. I'm just going to worship and praise you. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to move to a state of saying, you're God, I am not. I don't even know what to do next. So I'm just going to praise you until you give me my next steps. And he will. He'll bring a blessing. But here's the issue. Sometimes those blessings are challenges. And those struggles and those waiting times in our life. Think about Mary's blessing. I'm putting, a, I'm putting the child of God in you. Sounds like a pretty big deal, right? That seems like a pretty big blessing. And you, you might be pretty excited about it until you have to go tell Joseph, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, God did it. <laughs> Do you still want that blessing from God? Or the next nine months when you start showing and everyone's whispering, going, she says God did it. She has to live that. And then have this child not there. No, it's prophesied that they're going to go to Bethlehem and it's going to be a nativity scene. We are having your baby with some goats. Do you still want that blessing? Because I think only Joseph's there. And I wasn't a lot of help to my wife when it came to the babies being born. She had to have the babies. And it's, it's just as painful back then. And probably just as much need for help. And she's got goats. Do you still want that blessing? Or how about the idea that you now have to watch your baby go through life and be beaten and mocked and then put on a cross. It says she's right there. When all that's going on, she's there watching her child be put on a cross. I, do you still want that blessing? Now, what's the blessing, blessing God's given you? Because this is called a blessing. So when we start to think about how God has blessed us, yeah, sometimes it's an interesting word, blessed. It's a challenge. It's a sacrifice. It's a struggle. I can't tell you what it is for you. I don't know your scenario. But what I find throughout scripture, a lot of times the things that we're calling blessings are moments in life where we have to go, I don't know why this is going on. I don't know why I'm going through this. But God, I praise you. Can you at the end of the day go, this is hard. And I'm going to praise you anyway. 
That's who he shows up to. Mary closes like this. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Third takeaway. Remember, this is who... Who does God show up to? Who does God use? Where does he show up? The third one is he shows up in those who trust in his promises. Constantly throughout scripture, we see the characters of the Bible calling on God's promises. And that's where God is showing up. In this case, she says he'll bring down the rulers from their thrones and lift up the humble. That is probably a lot about the Roman Empire and a lot of just struggle that they're facing by the rulers of this age. But these are very specific. He'll fill the hungry with good things. He will show mercy. But this is really just the beginning. This is Mary calling on the promises to God. The rest of Luke is full of more promises. Tons of them. Every parable has a promise. There's promises just thrown into the side stories. There's so many promises from God. And that's Luke. You keep going. The entire Bible is full of promises. It's all about promises. And so what he's saying is, I want you to call on my promises. But we get so distracted and we forget and this world starts to overtake us with the challenges and the struggles. And we forget that we're supposed to constantly be calling on the promises, calling on the promises. And a lot of times we go, I did. And he still didn't show up. I've been waiting so long and I keep calling the promises. And he's like, keep calling on the promises. I'm in the waiting too. I sometimes like to go to Disneyland. And, which is a joke if you know me, but I, I do go fairly often. And I was there recently, and they have a ride called Snow White's Enchanted Wish. And they call this a new ride, but it's not a new ride. It's a fake new ride. It's where they take a really old ride, and they add a video screen. They say, new ride. But we had to go ride it, because it was new. And so we get in line, and it's like a 45-minute wait. Always. It it's, could be more. And I'm excited. The families there were excited. And we get to the front and I go, I'm going to videotape it. Which is ridiculous because it's in the dark. The whole video is black. But I videotaped it. And then I put it on YouTube so you can watch it. But I click the little button. I ride the ride. I get off. And I look down. It's less than two minutes. The video, including getting on and off, is less than two minutes. And I tell the family, I go, that ride was less than two minutes. We just waited like 45 minutes for this two minute thing. And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. It was, it was kind of, eh. And then I started thinking about it. And I go, actually, there was like a 45 minute wait to park my car. They have one parking structure and everyone goes in through the same entrance. There is another parking area, but you have to take a bus to the front and that's not magical. So we go into the parking structure and we wait 45 minutes. We park our car. We go down the escalator and then there's security. And security is always sort of challenging. There's always one guy who thinks he's the next like Marine and he wants to make sure he finds the bomb. I don't know. And then there's another one who does not care that they're there. He's like, yeah, go. We're looking for that guy. It takes us 30 minutes. We get through security. And then there's the tram. You have to wait for the tram. It's more magical than a bus, but it's not the first ride of the day. Everyone says it's the first ride of the day. It's a tram. I'll give you the monorail. I won't give you the tram for the first ride of the day. You wait. About three trams later, you get to the front. Then you experience the longest line. It's getting your ticket. Now, if you've discovered the internet, you don't wait in that line. But some people have not. They don't have a computer because that's the longest line. I'm always like, why are you in that line? It's like an hour. So you get your ticket. And guess what's next? A line. You go to the front gate. There's a line. And you have to wait because they have to take your picture to match your ticket to your picture. So you're not passing that ticket around, sharing the day with them. And each one, they take the picture and they're like, hey, you like your picture? No? Okay, let me try again. How does this work? What is this called? A phone? It's just so long. 
But you get through that line and you're excited. You're at the front of Disneyland. And then there's a parade. And the main street is tiny. And the floats are bigger than buildings. And you can't get through. And so there's just people everywhere. And you're like, boom, like a football star just pounding your way through to get to the first ride. Snow White's Enchanted Wish. And then you wait 45 minutes. I can tell you from experience, everything I just told you is absolutely true. <laughs> I've described some of your nightmare, right? And you're like, why would you do that? Why? I know I can hear you saying it. Why would you do that? And the answer is because of who I'm with. I'm with my family in every one of those experiences. And we have inside jokes. It's so funny. We have so many moments. We talk about those moments. We just, we videotape everything and we put it online to watch later. We're the only ones that watch it, but we've seen it like 500 times. And we're looking at it and laughing and remembering every single one of those moments. It's all about these moments with my family. My kids are trapped. And so we talk for so many hours about their whole life. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's such a blessing. I actually tear up sometimes because I'm like, those moments were so special. And it was the waiting. That two-minute ride was ridiculously dumb. But those hours with my kids made it all worth it. And we have a father in heaven saying the same thing. You're going to have these ups and downs in life. There's these big moments. We're all waiting for them. You know, you finish school. You finally get your first job. You're waiting for that first job. And then you're waiting for that special spouse. And then that first child. And then that child goes on through school and college. And then they get married. And you have that wedding. And you're like, oh, we've been waiting our whole life for this wedding. And then you have the wedding. And then you're waiting for the grandchild. And you can't wait for the grandchild. And then you're waiting for the funerals. I know it's sort of sad, but you're like, well, grandpa's going to go and die now. And your whole life, what is it? Waiting. You're just waiting and waiting and waiting for these moments. And there's a few. And there's tragic, tragic moments. Really, really hard ones. And then there's really, really high special ones. And God says over and over, I'm in the waiting. Continue to call on my promises. You're going to have so many times in life where you're like, God, I have been waiting so long. I've been calling out the promises. And he goes, yes. And I'm loving this time with you. Continue to wait and call on my promises. Can you humble yourself and know that I am God? Can you praise me anyway in the midst of what you're going through? Can you continue to trust that I love you? There's a whole book in the Bible called Job. I actually thought it was there by mistake for a long time because it's a really weird book. It's like God and Satan having a conversation. You're like, well, I can't even understand that part of it. And then there's the story. And at the end of the story, God literally tells Job, your friends, all the stuff they were saying is wrong. Well, that's like 30 chapters. And I'm like, there's 30 chapters where if somebody reads that and they go, well, it's in the Bible and I saw it and therefore it's real. It's like, well, you didn't read the whole thing because he literally says these parts aren't real. These aren't true. And then Job gets tired of waiting, gets mad at God, and there's a few chapters where he's just kind of exploding back at God. And we look at that and we go, yeah, yeah, I get it. But then God responds. And it's, uh, it's a pretty powerful response. In, ver in chapter 38, verse 4, he goes, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? It's like he took the mic and just dropped it and goes, and I'm done. Because I read that and I go, eh. I think he could have ended the book there. There's four more chapters where he's just like, boom, boom, boom. Every single verse is like, you need to be quiet. You need to be quiet. You need to be, it's so powerful. It's four chapters. But I think he could have stopped with the first line. You weren't there. Trust me. Can you still call on my promises? And finally, at the end, chapter 42, his response, Job's, you know, I spoke of things I did not understand. It's a really short chapter. He's got nothing he can say. I spoke of things I didn't understand. I need to continue to humble myself and know that you are God. I need to continue to just praise you 
in the waiting and call on your promises. They'll come when they come. He chooses Mary. Same reason. It's the Magnificat. I humble myself before you. I praise you because I don't know what else to do. And I'm just going to call on your promises as I face all these 30 years of challenge ahead. Where are you in this story? Can you say the same thing? Can you respond the same way? If you're here and you don't know this God, he wants to travel with you. He wants to move through life. He wants to watch the videos of this life and waiting with you. He wants to experience, he wants you to experience the best. And that's the relationship with him. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're here today and you're not traveling with this God, you're missing out. It's really good. We've all messed up. And he still loves you. He still went to the cross and died once and for all for you. There'll still be challenges. They'll still have ups and downs. But he wants to do it with you. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's finished. Now it's up to you. Do you accept it? How do you accept it? Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have someone that wants to do it with you. Do you believe it? Will you confess it? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm not going to pull you up front. not going to do anything weird, but going to give you a chance to make a confession to God. And I want to pray for you. If that's you today, you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Will you raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to travel with this God. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Amen. Anyone else? God, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you for this gift. can't believe how young she was. Lord, I I pray I would be that intelligent with my response to you when you call on me. And Lord, I think we all pray that. We want to continue to follow you with every action and praise you and call on your promises whether they're showing up or not until the day we're with you for eternity. I thank you for those that raised their hand. I pray, God, that they would have this incredible relationship forward with you as they travel together. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.